Hello, everyone, and welcome to our continuing series of classes from the Sandy Granite Family History Center. Tonight, uh, we have a great class uh, for you. A uh, good friend, uh, Richard Miller, who's the uh, creator and creative genius behind Goldie May. And uh, hopefully you've been able to uh, use Goldie May. If not, you'll find out about it tonight, plus some of the latest, greatest features from Goldie May as well. And uh, it is, it's a pretty neat tool to have in your, up in your menu bar uh, up there. So uh, this class can be viewed basically 24 seven at any time. And I'll put the link over in the chat, which is www.granitefhc.com. And then uh, at the conclusion of Richard's presentation, uh, we'll have a question and answer, but uh, feel free to uh, throw some questions out in the chat if you'd like, and uh, we'll get to them uh, at the end of the presentation. So, Richard, it's all yours. Okay, Bob, thank you. It's so kind of you. I appreciate it. And uh, let's make sure this video is good here. All right. Well, what I thought I'd show tonight is... Uh, some of the features that I didn't cover previously in the other Granite FHE presentation a few months back. Uh, Goldie May is, is supposed to be a research assistant. So as you're doing your genealogy with your family search window open on the left, you can have Goldie May open on the right. And this is what I have here. And it's supposed to help you, uh, you know, provide insight to your research so you can do your research better. So the, the previous presentation I did talked about how Goldie May has a, a free automatic research log. So as you're researching, visiting various web pages on the internet, it can keep a log of everywhere you've been and help you keep your notes, keep track of projects and tasks. Um, but what I thought I'd go over tonight is a newer timeline tool that uh, is called the Subway Map. And so this is a, a premium feature in a Goldie May subscription. And I thought I'd go over this and uh, just show how it can help your research. So what I'll go to here is the, I'm gonna to go to my tree first. And you'll see that um, if I choose, if I click on one of the names in my tree, you see this line drawn called the subway map. And uh, let me just show you some of the basics of the subway map first, if that's okay. And then uh, we'll, we'll go into kind of a case study of how you could use the subway map for your research. So I'll show you first this, ancestor of mine named Josephine. And here you're seeing the, the subway map is shows the places along the bottom, or sorry, the, the years along the bottom that she lived and then the places on the side. So she, the major places she lived were Copenhagen, Denmark and Utah. And so you see this place where she was born or in this case christened in 1846. And then you see the points of her life, uh, the birth of her children, residences in Denmark. And then these other white points are the times or the, the points, the facts that show her living in Utah. So this data comes from the family search tree. So uh, all the data on the left gets mapped onto this line on the right. And uh, some of the basics of the subway map are that a horizontal line means living in one place over time. So you, you expect that in the late 1800s and earlier, it's hard to move. So you would expect people to be in the same place over time, generally speaking. And then uh, a vertical line shows a migration. So she moved to Utah, that's a very big migration. So you see this sharp vertical line and we happen to have uh, records for her, you know, 1880, age 34, living in Denmark. And then just a couple years later at 36, she's living in Utah. So we get a really vertical line because there's data, you know, right before she moved and right after she moved. And then uh, if on the other hand, you see a diagonal line, and I'll show you one of those from a different ancestor, a diagonal line indicates some ambiguity about the sources. So for this lady, Mette, she lived in Denmark at age 32. And then nine years later, we have her living in Utah at age 41, but we don't know where she was for those nine years. So we don't know if she was, you know, did she, did she leave Denmark sooner or was it kind of at the end of that nine year period? We don't know. So one of the features of Goldie May is the hints. I've clicked, I've checked the hints box, and now you can see these gold circles that represent 
collections where she might appear. And so if she stayed in Denmark, she might appear in the 1850 census of Denmark or the 1855 Denmark census. Or alternatively, if she came to Utah early on, then we might find her in the 1850 US census. So the idea here is to give you hints of where you might look to figure out you know, where was she during that intervening time that's pretty ambiguous. Now you can click on a gold dot and then choose family search or ancestry to search for her inside that census. So if I wanna search for her inside the 1850 Denmark census on family search, I just click the button and then it launches a link. It launches a search for her. And uh, it, it's much easier to find her inside of a specific collection in a collection we might expect her to be in rather than you know, just typing her name into family search generally and hoping to, to find the match among all of the records in family search. So by pinpointing the places where we think she might be, it's much easier to find a match. So we might just go through and check, you know, three, each of these three points. Maybe we would check them both on family search and ancestry just to see. But the idea is that we're going to try to narrow down where we know she lived uh, to, you know, either Denmark or Utah. You know, she could have been somewhere else altogether, a third place. But we'd expect that maybe it's it's somewhere uh, that it's one of those two. So uh, those are the kind of the basics of the subway map lines. And then the you know the other features are that you can add other lines for other family members. So if you want to see where her father was or where her spouse was, you know, as you check those boxes, it adds additional lines and then you can compare the, uh, the places where each person lived over time. So let me show you just a couple other examples. Here's one from an ancestor showing born in England and then various uh, children born in England. And then you see this point that jumps over to New York. So it says that he had a child born in New York. And then all of a sudden, he's back in England for the birth of another child, back in New York, back in England. You get this zigzaggy pattern. And this is the late 1700s, early 1800s. It would be really unlikely that he would be back and forth across the Atlantic uh, for the births of children. Um, so it's just likely that this data is wrong and that maybe these the births of these children that we think are in New York, probably belong to another family. And, and you could check this manually if you wanted to. You could go into the family search profile and you see his 14 children. And you could click on the click on each child and see where they were born or christened and just kind of go one by one. You could do that manually, but the subway map is trying to tell you really quickly, uh, we've got a problem here. So if you're using the subway map and you see that zigzag shape, then you know, hey, let me look into this at least because there might be a story there. You know, it's possible that a zigzag could be okay. That there's a legitimate reason to be back and forth between two places. But more often than not, the zigzag pattern means we've got bad data. We've got some family members that really aren't part of the family and they, they belong elsewhere. So we'd wanna go, you know, find the family they belong to. Okay, so let me show you what the subway map looks like on a merge page. So say you're coming here to merge two profiles. If two people, two profiles really are the same person, we'd expect them to be at the same place at the same time. And that's what the subway map shows that these two profiles were in Massachusetts, born at the same time. And then they, they're kind of living in Massachusetts. And then the green line has more data, shows the person continuing to live in New York. But there's a lot of agreement between these two lines. So without even having to browse, you know, look through all the data on these profiles, which I still would do, the subway map clearly shows you that this is a really good match. And so we could feel confident about merging those two people together. And then similarly, let me show you, oh, next link. Let me show you what this looks like when we're attaching a record to the tree. This is one that, uh, this is my example I always use, and it actually got attached. And so I'm going to unattach it for the purpose of our demonstration here. But uh, we, you'll see these red dots appear. So the red dots are the data that will be added to the tree if this person is, if this source is added to this person. So you're seeing that uh, the tree says this person was born in 1898. And the record we're about to attach says 1899. So that's a great match, right? We'd expect a one-year difference on the census. And then likewise, 
the tree has these shows these black dots that this person lived in Dawson County, Nebraska. And similarly, the new record coming in says he lived in Dawson County, Nebraska, you know, 1930, right in between those two dots we already have. So with the help of the subway map, we feel really confident about merging this, this source in or attaching this source to the tree because it fits really well with the data that's already on the tree. And I'll go ahead and add that back. So uh, though that, maybe those are the basics of the subway map that what you could learn from this. And uh, I, there is a video that I've put on Roots Tech. So if you go to Roots Tech and you, you search for subway map, there's a video I've made about how I used to do this on paper. And then another alternative for uh, kind of a do-it-yourself approach is to do this with a spreadsheet. So the video shows doing it on paper and doing it uh, with a Google Sheets spreadsheet. And you can kind of map these out and there's a graphing option in Google Sheets. But the third option is to have Goldie May do it for you. And that's what we're, what we're doing here. So let me show you how, if we go to the tree, and by the way, feel free to stop me anytime for questions if, if uh, Bob's okay with questions along the way or we can wait till the end. And uh, okay, what I'll show you next is that if you hover over any of these people in your tree, it will draw the subway map for, for them. So suppose I'm, I wanna just go back from, you know, this is my great grandfather. I could go back through each of his ancestors on any line and just kind of check their subway line just to see if it looks like there's any anomalies. And, you know, Chrissy looked good. Hannah Collins also looks good. You see kind of just a steady progression from one place to the next, no zigzags. Um, you know, do the, do the places line up pretty well? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, one option you have, if, if, if you're looking at these places and you don't happen to know where they are in relation to each other, you know, I certainly don't know where the counties of, of England are in relation to each other. Uh, if I were looking at ev even the counties inside of Georgia or Arkansas or something, I wouldn't know where they are in relation to each other. But you can map the places with this link at the bottom left. So when you click that, it will open a Google map for uh, those places. And then you can see, hey, so North Carolina, Georgia, Arkansas, Missouri, you know, these are all kind of in the south. And then, you know, Washington's a big move, but maybe by early 1900s, that's, that's okay. So this one, you know, this line looks really good to me too. So I might just go back here to Rhoda Martin now. And, you know, she looks pretty good too, but what I'll do is just, and I could have done this for the other people too. I'm gonna, I'm changing to kind of looking at county by county instead of state by state. And here we get a little bit more zigzag. So, you know, living in Cherokee County, Georgia, then Gilmer County, Unknown County, Cobb, and then back to Cherokee County, and then back to Gilmer, um, Pickens County. Again, I don't know where these counties are, so I could map those and just kind of compare those. And you get so many places on this map that I end up just sort of taking out some of them. I'm going to drop out Georgia and I'll take out these North Carolina ones just to kind of get everything down to the Georgia counties. I'm just Xing out the ones that don't, don't fit. Okay, so here we've got four counties in Georgia and how close are they to each other? They're reasonably close to each other within Georgia. Okay, so maybe that's plausible that she, that, uh, she lived in these counties, but then we'd start to wonder, okay, why did, why did she move back and forth? What's going on here? One other thing we could look at is do these counties actually exist at the time that we, we think they existed? So, you know, if this child, Anna, was born in Cherokee County in 1843, did Cherokee ex County exist at that time? Well, we can open up Cherokee to the Family Search Wiki. And this will open the Cherokee article in the wiki so we can just reference what, uh, what time that, what year that county was started. And you'll notice that there's, there's links to the family history guide for that county, the catalog for that county, et cetera. Okay, so it says Cherokee County was organized in 1831. Okay, no problem there. We don't, uh, you know, this birth was after 1831, so no problem there. We could go county by county and just confirm that those counties match the time. Okay, so what else could we do to just figure out what's going on with this zigzaggy pattern? Well, we might want to check each of the sources. And this is, a, this is something that um, I like to just come back and give a fresh look at the sources that are under the sources tab. 
and just see if they all go together. So there's a tool that I like to use for this and uh, in Goldie May. And what I'll do is just go into projects and I'm going to create a new project for Rhoda Martin just to kind of keep all of our research together for her. And I'll just say, I'm going to check all the sources and children for Rhoda. And now I'll go to, you know, what you can see in the other Granite FHC, FHC video is the research log. And so just to give you kind of a quick view of that, I can take a screenshot of something that I'm seeing like this source and that will be put into the research log. So now I've got the link to it, an image of that piece of it, I could heart it or comment on it. And it just keeps all the research in one place, which is really nice. And what I like to do is just go through each of the sources in this person and create a little screenshot for all of them to give it a fresh look. So I'll go to 1860 and choose, I'm right clicking and choosing take a screenshot. And then I'm just drawing a box around this. And then I'll just go down to 1870 and do all these. And maybe I won't do all of them for sake of time here, but I'll just show you just a few of these. Let's go down and catch this one too. Okay, so this is the research log. I've logged these four images to the log. Uh, the research log is a free feature, but there's a, a premium feature that you can go use called the Canvas. And this is a different look at the same images you've already saved to your log. So I'll just kind of zoom out here and you can see that it's sort of um, a table as if you'd printed out your sources and put them on your kitchen table and now you can move them around and organize them. And so I just wanna give these a fresh look you know, I've taken screenshots of sources, but I could also take a screenshot of the tree itself. And so say I want to, you know, just have a list of the children to make sure they all fit. I could take a screenshot of the children, put that into my canvas as well. And now see if you can see this okay, but I'm just sort of moving these around just to compare. And I wanna just look and see how the children in the tree line up with the children in the sources. So, okay, we've got a child named Miller. You know, the ones here are Miller, Fielding, Hannah, Sarah, Miller, Fielding, Mary, Hannah, Sarah. So it looks like that Mary one um, doesn't necessarily fit or I don't see a source for her yet. And then uh, it looks like there's pretty good agreement with the sources themselves. In this next one, we've got uh, Sarah, Elizabeth, Barry, and here we've got Sarah, Elizabeth, Barry. So you see the older children leaving home and there's some uh, maybe some newer children born. Uh, likewise, this, you know, this one, these are pretty unique names, Ransom and Rhoda. So I, I think this, you know, these three decades of censuses or, or four decades look like they go well together and you see pretty good agreement with between the names of the children. But then I can just take a, you know, just a look through and compare that to the tree and say, okay, which children really don't belong? And maybe Mary is one of these that doesn't belong according to the sources. And I'd want to just jump over to Mary and look at her sources and start to look at, you know, how do we, where's the substantiation or the, where's the um, evidence that we think that her parents really are Ransom and Rhoda. So that's how I've kind of worked that out and kind of keep my notes. And that's how the, the canvas works. So let me go back to the subway map. So, okay, so we've talked about how the subway map can help you kind of find and, and diagnose a problem in your tree. I hope that part alone is helpful because, you know, when I look at my tree, it looks pretty full. You know, I didn't, I didn't build it all myself. I'm trying to stand on the shoulders of giants that have gone before me and done a lot of research. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's, you know, there's certainly lines that are new territory to me. And so when I'm wondering what to do and wondering if my tree is, you know, is my work all done? Uh, certainly, certainly not. There's, there's plenty to do. And the subway map is one way to discover what's missing. It, without it, you could also just go through and check all the births of the children, check for parent-child relationships. But to get a little bit of a shortcut view, I'm, I'm hoping that the subway map can help you find problems sooner and then help you resolve those problems by helping making it easier to 
look for records in the places where people should be and, and look for connections between the generations. So that's a, a quick rundown of the, the subway map. What I, what I want to show you now is just that it works with ancestry as well. So suppose, you know, I'll just go over to a person on ancestry and I'll turn off the check marks for Rhoda. This is America Jane Overlin, an ancestor of my wife, and it's showing the points for her. Now, it, a really interesting thing, which I think is cool about ancestry is that everybody gets their own tree, right? So it's not one shared tree, it's that everybody has their own tree. And some people are willing to share that tree with other users of ancestry. So if I go into the search option and choose uh, public member trees, I could search for Rhoda. And actually, let me just go back to Rhoda on this tab here so you can see her. What I want to do is look for Rhoda. I have, I have Rhoda here from Family Search. I want to look for her on Ancestry as well. And then we can uh, compare those two. So what I'll do is go into public member trees. We'll search for Rhoda Martin, born uh, 1812 and died 1897. Okay, well that comes up, you know, we're gonna see, all right, Rhoda Martin is found in 452 public trees. So quite a few, I'll click on just a few of those and I'm gonna hold down the command or control key to open a few of these in new tabs. So you'll see those opening right there. And what I can do is just briefly navigate to each of these tabs to have the subway map draw those. So you start to see a lot of colors and, and lines and this gets a little messy, but let me just kind of take it state by state and then we'll open up this a little bit. And all right, there's, let me uh, back up here and see what we can learn from this. Okay, look, the purple one just looks kind of really out there. I'm gonna remove that one. Uh, the green line too, oh, is, is my America Jane one? That doesn't fit, let me remove that one. So as we kind of, as we narrow this down a little bit, you start to see some patterns. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at Rhoda Martin in blue is the one from Family Search, And then the Rhoda Martin in green, red, and orange are from someone else's, three other people's family uh, trees on Ancestry. And so we could just start to look for patterns. So this, you know, this orange one shows her moving in various places in Tennessee and not a lot of agreement with the other three, maybe just for, to make that look less busy, I'll take out the orange one. Okay, what about, what about now? When we're looking at these three versions of Rhoda Martin, we see that the red one has a, a residence record that the other two doesn't. The green one has the birth of a half sister. Okay. You know, we could just kind of go through each of these points and say, you know, the blue line has her living in North Carolina because of the birth of this Mary child, uh, while the red and green lines have her in Georgia. So, okay, that's interesting. You know, Mary was that name that we thought didn't fit super well. And these trees on ancestry have this Mary daughter being born in Georgia while Family Search Tree has her born in North Carolina. So that's maybe, you know, maybe we need to go look at these ancestry trees for what sources they have to show up this daughter, Mary, in Georgia. And maybe that would solve our question about our ancestry, Mary, or our, our, our Family Search, Mary. So that's the idea is that you would just comb through and just look at the differences and points of these three trees. And, and maybe you'd find something there to help you substantiate that, uh, you know, the facts of your, your tree. Okay, so let me close those. And the other thing I wanna show you as kind of a new feature in, in uh, Goldie May is workspaces. So say I had a bunch of tabs open, actually I'll reopen all those tabs I just closed. If I had a bunch of tabs open like this, and I, I'm not done with them for the day. I'm still working, trying to figure things out. I can choose to save them all to a workspace. So this is the idea that I am bookmarking all of these pages for another day. 
Now, if I close this window and maybe I come back the next day or I go to, you know, I go to the library and log in with Goldie Mae there, or I go to a friend's house, log into Goldie Mae there, I can come back and choose to open all those tabs that were previously there again. And then my work just comes right back to me and I can pick it up right where I left off. So you could have, you know, various workspaces for the various projects you're working on. And I find that to be a pretty good, it's almost an alternative to a research log in some ways, because, it, you know, it's not that I've meticulously logged each page and, and uh, it's sort of just work in progress. I, I'm not done with it. I want to keep looking at this, but I don't want to keep all these tabs open. So it just lets me save all my tabs and windows to one place and associate them with this project I'm working on for Rhoda. And then later I can, you know, switch to another project and, 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 uh, and come back to her later. So, you know, if I switch to one of my other projects, you can see a couple of, you know, windows worth of tabs that I've saved from another project. And I have all these different projects here. So that's the idea that you'd just uh, be able to come back to those in the future. So that's a pretty fast rundown of the latest features in Goldie May. Uh, for me, the subway map is, I'm hoping the subway map really helps to visualize what's going on in your family tree, look for issues, and then with the hints, potentially find answers. You know, you can look for her in various census records, and you can also use the links on the left side to look for information about those places and, and find more records from those places. So I'll pause there and Bob or anyone else, are there any questions that I should take? I'm not seeing anything on chat. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's easy. That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. What did I, what else could I, what did I leave out, Bob? Is there anything that, uh, question any gaps that i didn't describe well oh you might explain to people how to get to goldie may oh sure yeah so if you go to goldiemay.com you'll see a let me go big on this window you'll see this install goldie may for free button you click that and then it'll say add to chrome mine says remove from chrome because i already have it and so then you would uh, you'd click add to Chrome and then you'll see this black G up here in the top right. If you don't see it, then it'll be under the jigsaw icon. So you can <laughs> click on this jigsaw icon, click Goldie May, and that pops open the side window. And then at first it would be logged out. So you would see it like this. And then you just sign in with your family search account and then you're off to the races. So, you know, you, you as a free user, you wouldn't see all these options at first. You would see projects and research log. Um, volunteering. So the idea there is that you could start a new project and say, um, you know, I want to work on um, finding children for, you know, some ancestor of yours. You could put in their family search person ID if you want to get more information about that. And then you have a research log where as you log different, you know, you go to different pages and tabs and things and click log, it will log those to your, to your log. And then you can like and dislike and comment, et cetera. So that's the, those are the basics of the research log that you could kind of keep track of everywhere you've gone. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Bob. Thanks for saying that. Perfect. I just wanted to make sure people knew how to do it because we have yeah. all our computers in the Family History Center as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions anyone may have? Do you have any? Um, any presentations scheduled from here on out, uh, Richard, on the- Yeah, I will be speaking at the BYU Family History Library in June, uh, probably the 12th, maybe the 26th. Uh, and then, yeah, I have a few presentations on Roots Tech. So if you go to rootstech.org and search for Goldie May or Richard Miller, there's more about each of these features and then, uh, and then, yeah, there's the kind of the do-it-yourself version of the subway map video in there too, for showing how to, you know, how to do this with a spreadsheet, basically. And then there's that little, like, an intro video too on the homepage. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you could go back to that video and, um, yeah, here and you scroll down and it'll do a Goldie May in 90 seconds, so pretty fast, but it just gives you the quick overview of everything. You talk really fast. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay.
Well, great. Yeah, good. Thank, thank you so much, Richard. And thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. You, you bet. We'll get this posted in a few days. And of this one, along with the first one you did, which is already posted, uh, make a really good primer. For yeah, me. no, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. And thanks for letting me come on and talk about it. You're welcome. Well, good night, everyone. We're going to sign off and we'll have it posted here in a few days. Good. Thanks, Bob. You bet. See you, Rich. See you later.